G'day, welcome to Emergency Medicine Topics in One Coffee. I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician, and today's topic is acute life-threatening asthma. Now, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm a bit wheezy, I'm blowing 50% of my expected spirometry. I'm talking about sweaty, agitated, think I'm gonna die, sphincter tightening, life-threatening asthma. So generally, what do these patients look like? Well, they can't speak in anything but just a few words, certainly at short sentences at most. They have that sort of wide-eyed agitation to them from the combination of hypoxia and hypercarbia. And they're usually sitting up and using their accessory muscles to breathe. You know, they've got tracheal tug, intercostal and subcostal recession. Okay, so let's first look at what's a framework we can put together to sort of approach the care of these very complicated patients. So what do you need? Well, you need space, you need staff, and you need stuff. So the space. If you get a bat phone call in and you know they're coming in, make that space. The appropriate space is, of course, the resuscitation room. But like every emergency department, you might have to push, prioritise, juggle with the nurse in charge to create that space. But you need it. This is a full resus. What staff do you need? Well, as I said, it's a full resus. So you need an airway doctor, airway nurse, procedure doctor, procedure nurse, and a team leader, medical and nursing, as a starting point. What about the stuff? Well, let's look at an... Um, from A, B, C. Let's look at the airway stuff that you require. Now I know you don't want to intubate an asthmatic. However, if you prepare, as they say, you'll prevent piss poor performance. That preparation is, well let's get the drugs together, let's draw them up. Ketamine for your induction. Succimethonium or rocuronium for your paralytic. Videolingoscope we would use a CMAC, uh, the Buji, the ETT, all being prepared. And of course, prepare your ventilator and go through your airway drills between the airway doctor and the airway nurse. So then you can go on to your breathing. What do you need to prepare for your breathing? Well, the patient will probably have high flow nasal oxygen as possible, so you should get that ready. You should prepare your BiPAP because Many of these patients will end up on BiPAP. And that's probably most of what you need for your breathing initially. Okay, what about circulation? Well, you need to have two good IVs. But remember, these patients are often sweaty when they come in. So if you used to use Steri-Strips, sometimes the IVs will come out, which can be a real mess. So I'd make sure that you dry the area and use elastoplast to hold in position for your IVs. Hang some normal saline because they'll often be hypovolemic because they've been breathing quickly. They've got all this insensible loss. So they'll need to have an intravenous fluid bolus. Anything else you should get drawn up? Well, I would draw up some IV hydrocortisone, uh, 200 milligrams, and uh, some magnesium sulfate because most of these patients will require this as part of their initial treatment. Okay, let's take a step back from the important space, staff and stuff. Let's say you've got that together. I like to think of life-threatening asthma, and it's somewhat artificial, into two major groups. I call them the chuggers and the guppies. So what's a chugger? Well, a chugger is the much more common um, life-threatening asthma that we see. Patients had a long history of asthma, they're on preventatives, they've got an upper respiratory tract infection, they've had an increasing use of their salbutamol puffers, such that they've been taking them every hour or so, they've increased their steroids at home, they've become more short of breath, they've become tired, and they're chugging along, short of breath, and they turn up to your emergency department. Okay, that I consider is the chug, it's much more common. The other one is the guppy. The guppy is the patient has rapid onset, has had some precipitant and caused bronchospasm. They come in very short of breath, like a guppy out of water, in extremis. 
An example of this would be the tragic thunderstorm asthma in Melbourne in 2016. So these two subgroups are treated similarly initially, but they have sort of a different direction of their treatment. Okay, so what about the treatment for these chuggers? Well, remember we've already done that generic treatment earlier. Specifically, these patients often uh, get a good result with BiPAP. So I would put them on sort of, they need a bit of inspiratory support, eight to 10, just a tad of expiratory support, two to four. The FiO2, well, put them up as 40%, you can increase to 60%, whatever you need to keep the saturations up. Solbutamol infusion, well in Australia we would give a solbutamol bolus, four micrograms per kilo over about 10 minutes, and then go on to an infusion. In the United States, of course, they would use an epinephrine infusion, or adrenaline infusion. What about the role of ketamine and a ketamine infusion? Well, ketamine can be very useful if you're used to using it uh, to get people sort of able to go on BiPAP when they're quite agitated. Uh, but so in a, a titrated ketamine infusion with its own little bronchodilation can be useful uh, in this chugger group. Okay, so with the chuggers, you've done well. You've got them on BiPAP, they've turned the corner, you've been guided by your blood gases, and they've been able to leave your emergency department most of the time and go to intensive care. Let's look at the other group. These are those guppies. These are the ones that really scare me. They're the ones that have that flash sudden bronchospasm, and they may come in in extremis. They've got that guppy appearance again. They've got a high CO2, they've got a low O2, they're sweaty, they're agitated. You may be forced to intubate these patients. Luckily, with your space, staff and stuff approach, you've got everything ready for your intubation. You've anticipated this may be a problem. So, if you're able to buy a bit of time with some high flow nasal oxygen, 40 liters per minute, okay, do that. Uh, what are you gonna use for induction? Ketamine. I'd give, for an adult, 200 milligrams intravenously, and then use either succimethonium to paralyze them at two milligrams per kilogram IV, or rocuronium one milligram per kilogram IV. Intubate them with a large intratracheal tube, using a bougie, using a CMAC, and then once you've done that, paralyze them and sedate them with a ketamine infusion. But so what? You've got a tube down there. You haven't physiologically changed a whole lot. They've still got all the bronchospasm occurring. When you put them on the ventilator, there's a couple of important things that you need to be aware of. So you can go in as fast as you like, but you need to breathe out really slowly so that they can exhale completely. So we're talking about pretty small um, uh, tidal volumes and frequencies. Tidal volumes, six mils per kilo, um, what respiratory rate, six or eight to eight per minute. And then titrate that, check with your blood gases, see if your CO2 is rising. Try and keep your, don't worry too much about your peak pressures, but try and keep your plateau pressures less than 30 centimeters of water. Okay, so what are the problems that can occur? Well, even if you've got these ventilator settings, you might still get breath stacking, where the end of each breath hasn't fully gone out and you increase the pressure with each, with each breath. And that can blow pneumothorax, can cause gross hypotension, uh, which along with the, uh, just the um, hypovolemia of the patient can be quite profound. So you need to anticipate that and regularly check your pressures, regularly check your gases. So well done, you've managed to safely intubate and put in a ventilator the guppy. Um, you've managed to save their life and you've got intensive care involved. So what sort of heroic measures may intensive care attempt? Well, you can do physical compression to try and physically push the air out in expiration. It occasionally works. They may use Heliox or ECMO 
So these things are possible to, and they usually be run by intensive care. Okay, so this is quite brief, so let's just recap. So important things, anticipate with space, staff and stuff. I like to think of those two slightly separate groups, the chuggers and the guppies. When you put a patient with asthma on BiPAP, think about A2, sort of IPAP and EPAP. When you intubate, know that just because you've intubated doesn't physiologically change too much. So you'll be careful about your ventilator settings. That ketamine can be your friend, both to assist to put someone onto a BiPAP, but also as your sedation of, of choice when someone's on a ventilator as a ketamine infusion. Okay. Look, I think that'll just about do for life-threatening <laughs> asthma in one coffee. I'll see you next time. Cheers.